150 years ago, Charles Darwin transformed science with his theory of natural selection. Today, that theory faces a formidable challenge. Intelligent design has sparked both discovery and intense debate over the origin of life on Earth. And for a growing number of scientists, it represents a paradigm. An idea with the power to, once again, redefine the foundations of scientific thought. Natural selection is a real process, and it works well for explaining certain limited kinds of variation small-scale change. We have lots of examples of that, in fact. Where it doesn't work well is explaining what Darwin thought it could, namely the real complexity of life. We have the finch beak, and then you've got the finch itself. A minor change in the structure of the beak versus the origin of the orism itself. These are different scales of phenomena. These are different kinds of problems. And the important problem for biology is to understand where natural selection works and where it doesn't and why there's a difference. Evidence is very powerful and all of us had the sense that if we let that evidence speak for itself, that it would lead us in a very different direction, away from natural selection and towards a different conclusion about the origin and nature of life on Earth. For Charles Darwin, natural selection explained the appearance of design without a designer. There was no longer any need to invoke an intelligent cause for the complexity of life. In effect, natural selection became a kind of designer substitute. But in the last half century, our knowledge of the cell has just exploded. I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts in all of its glory. It's had a propeller and a hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor and, and so on. I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That, that's designed. You know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. But could Darwin's small, favorable variations have produced a bacterial flagellum? Some scientists doubt the possibility. How could something new, like a bacteria flagellar motor and all the components that go with it, how could it develop out of a population of bacteria that don't have that system? When each change, according to Darwin's theory, has to provide some kind of advantage. Imagine such a scenario early in the Earth's history. An evolving bacterium somehow develops a tail and perhaps even the pieces necessary to attach it to the cell wall. Yet without a complete motor assembly, this innovation would provide no advantage to the cell. Instead, the tail would lie immobile and useless, invisible to natural selection, which by definition can only favor changes that aid survival. The logic of natural selection is very demanding. Unless the flagellum mechanism is completely assembled and actually works, natural selection simply cannot preserve it. It cannot be passed on to the next generation. The important thing to realize about natural selection is it selects only for a functional advantage. In most cases, natural selection actually eliminates things, things that have no function or that have a function that harms the organism. So if you had a bacterium with a tail that didn't function as a flagellum, chances are natural selection would eliminate it. The only way you can select for a flagellum is if you have a flagellum that works, and that means you have to have all the pieces of the motor in place to begin with. So natural selection can't get you the bacterial flagellum. It can only work after the flagellum is there and operating. In evolutionary terms, you have to be able to explain how you can build this system gradually when there's no function until you have all those parts in place. In 1996, Michael Behe published a book titled Darwin's Black Box. In it, he argued that natural selection, Darwin's designer substitute, could not explain the origin of the bacterial flagellum or any other irreducibly complex biological system. Instead, Behe concluded that the integrated complexity of these systems pointed to intelligent design. Behe's critics also insisted that he had underestimated the power of natural selection. They argued that the flagellar motor could have been constructed from parts used to build simpler molecular machines, like this needle-nose cellular pump, 
If the components of the pump already existed, they could have been preserved by natural selection even before the bacterial motor arose. This theory is called co-option. It's essentially saying that evolution or natural selection at some point was able to borrow components of one molecular machine and build a new machine with some of these components. Scott Minnick has studied the flagellar motor for nearly 20 years. His research has led him to challenge the co-option argument. With a bacterial flagellum, you're talking about a machine that's got 40 structural parts. Yes, we find 10 of them are involved in another molecular machine, but the other 30 are unique. So where are you going to borrow them from? Eventually, you're going to have to account for the function of every single part as originally having some other purpose. So you can only follow that argument so far until you run into the problem of you're borrowing parts from nothing. But even if you concede that you have all the parts necessary to build one of these machines, that's only part of the problem. Maybe even more complex, I think more complex, is the assembly instructions. That is never addressed by opponents of the irreducible complexity argument. The irreducible complexity of molecular machines poses a severe challenge to the power of natural selection. According to Darwin's theory, even very complex biological structures like an eye, an ear, or a heart can be built gradually over time in small incremental steps. Yet as Darwin made clear, natural selection can only succeed if these random genetic changes provide some advantage to the evolving organism in its struggle for survival. By definition, natural selection could not have functioned before the existence of the first living cell. For it can only act upon organisms capable of replicating themselves. Cells equipped with DNA that pass on their genetic changes to future generations. Without DNA, there is no self-replication. But without self-replication, there is no natural selection. So you can't use natural selection to explain the origin of DNA without assuming the existence of the very thing you're trying to explain. 150 years ago, scientists did not know about irreducibly complex molecular machines. Yet Charles Darwin anticipated the difficulty that systems such as these could pose to his theory. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Since the late 19th century, since the time of Darwin, in fact, in part because of Darwin's writing in The Origin of Species, scientists came to con accept a convention, a definition of science that excluded the possibility of design as a scientific explanation. And that convention has a name. It's called methodological naturalism. And it just means that if you're going to be scientific, you must limit yourself to explanations that invoke only natural causes. You can't invoke intelligence as a cause. And yet, curiously, we make inferences to intelligence all the time. It's part of our ordinary reasoning to recognize the effects of intelligence. Since its discovery, scientists have tried to understand how a rotary motor could have arisen through natural selection. As yet, they have failed to offer any detailed Darwinian explanation. When I look at molecular machines, or the incredibly complex process by which cells divide, I want to ask, is it possible that these things had an intelligence behind them, that there was a plan or a purpose to this structure? Science ought to be a search for the truth about the world. Now, we shouldn't prejudge what might be true. We shouldn't say, I don't like that explanation, so I'm going to put it to one side. Rather, when we come to a puzzle in nature, we ought to bring to that puzzle every possible cause that might explain it. One of the problems I have with evolutionary theory is it artificially rules out a kind of cause even before the evidence has a chance to speak. And the cause that's ruled out is intelligence.